I felt an obligation to do what I could for the for the country and, and for my my friends and uh, those sailors that I was palling around with they were they were pretty much of an influence too. They were going to war and I felt like I should do something. It was sad. So when I got on that train in Jacksonville and headed up to Norfolk, Virginia, it was really sad because I had never been away from home and got up there and seen all that snow on the ground that scared me to death. The I said, snow. what have I gotten myself into here? I think I had been in ROTC in high school and I enjoyed the uh, drilling and the marching and the bands and stuff like that, so I, I really enjoyed that part of it. I didn't like the, uh, the clothes scrubbing and stuff like that that goes along with boot camp. But, uh, then from Norfolk, I, I went to uh, signal school, and uh, when I graduated from that school, and uh, became a third class petty officer. They sent me to the amphibious forces, and that was up at Solomon Island, Maryland. And it wasn't anything but a clay field, and everywhere you step while you was in bogging up, it was a kind of a makeshift outfit, and that's where I trained for the amphibious forces. We uh, would spend quite a bit of time uh, studying weaponry, gunnery, and a lot of time uh, they'd send an LST up there and we would we'd form a crew and replace the or go with the crew for training purposes up in the Chesapeake Bay. What is an LST? That's a landing ship tank. It's 327 feet long. It's kind of like a, a big barge got twin diesel motors that drives it, and uh, its purpose is to land heavy artillery and tanks on beaches. That's During the tour of duty, we'll aboard that LSC-355, and we put it in commission down in Charleston, South Carolina as a new ship and I went aboard as one of the crew members of it. I think it has a crew of roughly 120 men, and uh, the crew quarters are back aft, and the whole forward part of the ship is its two decks. It's the uh, main deck, and then below that is what we call the tank deck, and it had a ramp. Uh, and bow doors on it. The bow doors would open, the ramp come down, and you could drive tanks in and out. And it had an elevator on it to where you could, the t trucks and heavy artillery and stuff, you could take up to the main deck, transport it that way. And it had two uh, Davids on it that carried uh, LCVPs. That's a landing craft personnel. After we put the ship in commission, we brought it up to Little Creek, Virginia, and we went through under, underwent some training in the Chesapeake Bay, and um, for a short time, and none of us knew what we were doing. But anyway, they sent us on up to uh, New York, uh, where we we loaded out and joined a convoy and went to uh, North Africa. We uh, had a problem. We were making a landing up in Arzu, North Africa, and uh, we broached in, um, in trying to free ourselves. We messed up one of our chefs. Broached means going sideways onto the beach instead of you know, so we uh, lost the shaft and and parts and everything was not available, so we had to wait in our zoo for them to send us a new shaft over, and then we went to Oran, 
North Africa and went into the dry dock there and they put the new shaft on. And then they sent us to uh, Bizzerti, North Africa, to load out for the Salerno invasion. That was the Italian. And that was a, a nasty one. I, um, when we finally, they, they, there were some German tank divisions that the, I guess the Army didn't know about. The, they were on R&R &R right there in that area. And they were sitting up there in the hills and giving us a fit. They were shooting us up pretty bad. In order to do something about the Tiger tanks, we had some heavy guns aboard our ship and they sent us in way before they had the beachhead cleared. And, and uh, because we had about the only thing, you know, that could fight that t Tiger tank and they had to get them ashore and they told us to go at all costs. And uh, we made the beachhead and, and uh, got shot up pretty bad. And some, I was a signalman, and uh, during the time we were there, we were getting shelled pretty bad because the destroyers and couldn't get in there to give us a lot of a lot of support for the shallow water. But the uh, USS Mayo, I'll never forget it, uh, DD-422 had escorted us part of the way in and then had to peel out, you know, because of the shallow water. But I remember getting on the searchlight and calling them to please come and give us some some support. And then one of our light cruisers moved in and and helped us out some. Well, they, they would try to go, uh, but there was a sandbar out there. And there was some deep water between the sandbar and the beach where we had to land them. So we had to use pontoons that we had brought with us and drop those pontoons down and rig them and and uh, run across the pontoons and got them, got them ashore. Well, after they got that that heavy artillery ashore, well, it alleviated the situation some, but. It was still several hours before the beachhead was secured. We, uh, after we unloaded, uh, we were going back to Bizzerti to get another load and repair some of our damage. We had gotten 18 hits, I think, on our starboard side. And uh, they needed to weld some plates over that and get us seaworthy again. And we were go headed back to Bizzerti to do that, and uh, they held us up and told us to anchor at Palermo, Sicily, where we remained overnight until they could figure out whether they wanted to evacuate the beach and send us back empty or either reinforce it. So they decided to reinforce it, and we went on to Bizzerti. And then came back? Five times. Five times. Five you, times. You made the trip. Yeah. Okay. From uh, after Salerno, they in uh, I believe it was November. Salerno was in September, and then in November, uh, October or November, they ordered us to the uh, to England to train for the Normandy invasion. So we joined the convoy at Gibraltar and headed out towards the Azores to try to get far enough away from the, uh, uh, to France, you know, to where the German Air Force was, and get out of their range. And then the submarines got after us and gave us a pretty hard time. And they sent some heavy bombers out with the uh, first time we had ever seen radio-controlled bombs. And, and they harassed us all the way into Falmouth, England, where we anchored. Okay. They, well, we made it <laughs> somehow. I remember them sinking a couple of three ships, you know. But the thing that affected me mostly was watching that heavy bomber would drop that bomb underneath it and then guide it into the 
ship, you know, radio control. And while I had the binoculars on it, watching one, it headed straight for us. And we had a piece of canvas uh, around the edge of the bridge, just canvas. And I went and hid behind that canvas so that thing wouldn't get me. So, like canvas would do a lot of good, you know. Well, the best I can recall, it's been a long time, and uh, but we loaded out our troops down in Falmouth and had a bunch of soldiers board and our tanks and, 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 and all of their guns and stuff. And uh, we headed out, and it was cold, it was raining, and the troops had no place to sleep other than on the deck. And uh, we headed out and got out channel and and the uh, weather worsened so bad until they called the invasion off for another day. And there we were stuck with all those troops on board, no way to feed them and no place for them to sleep. But we went into Weymouth, I believe it was Weymouth, England, and uh, anchored that night. And the next day they, we convoyed up and went on into the Normandy thing. They just delayed it for 24 hours. We transported the uh, tanks and their crews and heavy artillery and their crews. And, and we also had um, um, some racks built on the side of the tank deck that folded down with a pad on them. And then they put a lot of hospital corpsmen aboard and two or three doctors so that once we unloaded all of our equipment, our tanks and our artillery, then we turned us into a hospital ship. And so they would bring casualties aboard and get them treated aboard the ship there because there was no, uh, there was no hospital set up on shore yet, you know. And I don't know, maybe we saved some lives, maybe we didn't, I don't know. At Utah Beach, I thought it was, after having gone through Salerno, I thought it was just to walk ashore, actually. Of course, the, uh, our tanks came out, and we was all cheering them on, saying, oh, boy, wait till our guys get up there. They're going to blow them away, you know. And, and uh, those Tiger tanks, uh, our little old Shermans, was no, no contest. Them Tiger tanks were blowing them up <laughs> as fast as we could send them ashore. <laughs> We were the third LST in a column of about five or six going into the beach, and the ship ahead of us hit a mine and uh, <clears throat> broke in half and spilled off a bunch of soldiers and everything in the ocean. And uh, there was a soldier aboard our ship that had a brother aboard this other ship. And I remember him coming up to the bridge, you know, and pleading with our commanding officer to please stop and pick his brother up, you know, as survivors. And we 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 had to refuse, you know. And that was that was one of the things that stuck in my mind, you know, the necessities of war. Normally, you do everything you can to rescue anybody, but in situations like that where you, you, that is not your mission. Your mission is to get your tanks and all ashore. So that, that takes priority. And that, that was a terrible thing, you know, to have to tell that boy, no, we can't stop and pick up your brother. Back and forth, you know, from ship to ship, uh, or from the flagship to our ship, and all of our orders uh, had to come through the signalman. They used searchlights, you know, in the Morse code. Courses, speeds, position, what position you were supposed to be in the convoy, and things of that nature. Okay. Everything to do with the navigating of that ship. Okay. From Because you always had a flagship or a convoy commodore, you know, and they would send messages to you, what, what, whatever they wanted you to do. So this is to keep you guys tactically in sync with one another? Yeah, right. Exactly. Exactly. We made 
I believe 53 trips back and forth, like a ferry boat, ferry and, uh, well, at one point they put uh, railroad tracks down on our tank deck and we'd haul complete trains in three sections, they'd back them in, back them over here, and back another one in here, and then when they left the ship, there'd uh, be a whole train load of supplies for the Army, and they, that saved a lot of uh, loading and unloading. What, ha what happened after that? Mm -hmm. They sent us home. They sent you home? Yeah. Where were you on uh, VE Day? Uh, in the middle of the uh, Atlantic, coming home. We'd left Portsmouth, England, had a big air raid the night before we left, as a matter of fact. But we got out of there and uh, headed home, and the war was over before we got there. Did we lose shipmates? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. We would go back, we'd leave Salerno and go back into Bizzurdi, North Africa, and they had a signal station out there on the point. And they would always, you'd always report to that signal station when you were coming in, and they would always come back and say, report number of casualties, prisoners of war. And I thought that was kind of odd, you know. But we'd, we'd always report the number of casualties that we had. We weren't hauling any prisoners of war at that time. However, we did haul a lot of prisoners from Normandy back to England. I was in, uh, Camp Bradford, uh, waiting and reassignment, and uh, I had left my ship, the old LST, we carried it to New Orleans and put it in the shipyard and they were had some plan for turning it into an ARL or something. And so uh, this whole, our, our old crew, uh, we we went back for reassignment, and uh, we I had gone on 30 days leave, and then I reported back to uh, Camp Bradford for reassignment. And then during that time, they dropped the bomb on them, uh, ended the war. But <coughs> I left Camp Bradford and went to Charleston, South Carolina, and uh, or Savannah, Georgia and uh, went aboard the George K. McKenzie, which was a destroyer. And it had just finished its shakedown cruise and was getting ready to go to the, I know, to the invasion of Japan. So needless to say, I was pretty happy whenever they ended that war. I had lived through one and I didn't have, figure my chances too good, you know, of, making it through another one, not with all the suicide planes that the Japs were using. I went to the University of Florida for a little while, but couldn't adjust. I just simply couldn't adjust, and uh, uh, I went back in the Navy. And I said that I found a home <laughs> and, and stayed. <clears throat> How did it affect the rest of my life? Well, I don't know. I, it's hard to tell. Uh, I would have probably graduated from high school, got a little job somewhere in Jacksonville, you know, and raised a family down there. And uh, But as it was, well, I got away from there. I, I don't know uh, any words of wisdom or anything that I could pass on. And, because our young people coming up now is much smarter than we are. Uh, they have the capability anyway. They have access to a lot more information than we had. So they should be able to uh, form their own opinions about things a lot better than we did. I hope that our little get-together here today benefits some of my five great-granddaughters and my great-great-grandson, <laughs> and maybe they'll get some benefit from it. 
yeah. World War II to those children, you know, or something like the Revolutionary War was to our generation, you know what I mean. And it's something that happened way back in the past. I don't know that, I, I don't think that they can possibly understand the, the uh, seeing so many American soldiers, you know, and scattered all over the beach, you know, busted up, you know, and I, I don't think the, the real American mind can comprehend the destruction and the uselessness of war, you know. That, that, that's one thing that's always lasted with me anyway. I don't think it's something to be avoided at all costs. But I think that it's the last resort. There ain't no sense of people going out there trying to kill each other, you know. It's a funny thing. It's, uh, one of the odd things about war is that when the Italian Navy came in and surrendered just before uh, uh, Salerno, I, we, as I told you before, we were in Palermo, Sicily. It anchored that night, and the next morning, part of the Italian Navy came in and surrendered at Palermo, Sicily. And I happened to be on watch up on the bridge that morning, seeing all those Italian ships coming in, and got a little bit nervous because they were, they were fine ships. But they were flying white flags at the mast, and they were coming in to surrender to the Americans. And that night, see, the day before, we were trying to kill each other. And that night, we were all ashore in Palermo having a beer together. And that's the, one of the ironic things about war. Sailors of whatever nationality have a tremendous respect for each other. And you respected them as sailors, not as necessarily as Italians. I think it's a terrible thing. Uh, it just don't make too much sense, you know, people out there trying to slaughter each other. But maybe it becomes necessary sometime that you have to do that. Like when the Japs bombed Pearl Harbor, we had no choice. We had to defend the country. And so, I don't know, you, you hate it, but you feel in, that it's necessary sometime. I don't feel too good about what we're doing in Iraq and all, but I think perhaps we need to stay out of other people's business more. And that's just the opinion of an old war out sailor. Mm -hmm.